Chapter 1 You Are What You Eat. It's 10 p.m., and my partner in writing and crime, Mark Lehner, and I are late as usual, but the party is in full swing. We brought a bottle of Don Julio tequila, which Lehner sampled voraciously in the cab, insisting that it needed to be screened for industrial toxins. We enter the elegantly appointed Park Avenue home of Eloise Cameron, a philanthropist, patron of the arts, and Botox junkie. Hors d'oeuvres are being served, and the slightly inebriated and flush faced Lehner grabs a mouthful of Swedish meatballs. Kisses our hostess and then comments, Eloise, baby, better lay off the collagen. Kissing those lips is like making out with the Michelin man. She attempts to smirk with disdain, but the Botox leaves her face impassive. I corral Laner and we proceed into the living room. No sooner have we entered when I'm embraced from behind. I turn around and it's Jeremy Burns. An investment banker who sits two rows behind me at the Knicks games. Jeremy is well known to the Madison Square Garden food vendors for his insatiable appetite for hot dogs, cotton candy, and beer. He is now almost unrecognizable in his new Atkins induced skeleton like state. Who exhumed you? Laner belches. I am overcome by embarrassment, but secretly wetting myself with laughter. Jeremy tries to sidestep Laner, and as their arms brush, Laner is covered with the grease that now oozes from Jeremy's pores. Laner whispers to me, This dude is all greased up like a rectal thermometer. I push Laner away, and he uses this opportunity to sneak over to the bar for another blast of Don Julio. I am left with Jeremy and his insufferable stories about life on the meat and fat diet, and a million medical questions about food. If we are what we eat, why do we know so little about food and nutrition? Does it really take seven years to digest chewing gum? What is it with seven years? You break a mirror, seven years of bad luck. Each dog year is seven human years. Seven years to digest swallowed gum? What if a dog broke a mirror, then swallowed a pack of gum? Sounds like an algebra problem. Chewing gum is not digestible, but it definitely doesn't sit in your stomach for years. Gum actually might help things move through the bowels faster. Sorbitol is sometimes used as a sweetener in gum, and this can act as a laxative. What does this mean? Yes, if you look carefully, you should see it floating next to all those lovely yellow corn kernels. Why does your pee smell when you eat asparagus? Asparagus contains a sulfur compound called mercaptan. It is also found in onions, garlic, rotten eggs, and in the secretions of skunks. The signature smell occurs when the substance is broken down in your digestive system. Not all people have the gene for the enzyme that breaks down mercaptan, so some of you can eat all the asparagus you want without stinking up the place. One study, published in the British Journal of Clinical Pharmacology, found that only 46% of British people tested produced the odor, while 100% of French people tested did. Insert your favorite French joke here. What causes an ice cream headache? Ah, the joy of a popsicle on a hot summer day. One theory places the source for the brain freeze. In the sinuses, where the pain may be caused by the rapid cooling of air in the frontal sinuses. This triggers local pain receptors. Another theory postulates that the constriction of blood vessels in the roof and rear of the mouth causes pain receptors to overload and refer the pain to your head. There is a nerve center there in the back of your mouth called the sphenopalatine ganglion. And this is the most likely source of the dreaded ice cream headache. A friend of ours suggested a quick cure of rapidly rubbing your tongue on the roof of your mouth to warm it up. Her demonstration included a bizarre clucking sound. Laner tried this and found himself followed by a large goose of whom he seems to have become inordinately fond. 
Why do you cry when you cut onions? Cutting an onion releases an enzyme called lacrimatory factor synthase. This starts the process that leads to tears. This enzyme then reacts with amino acids of the onion, and the amino acids are converted to sulfenic acids. The sulfenic acids spontaneously rearrange to form synpropanethyl S oxide, which is released into the air. When this chemical reaches the eyes, it triggers the tears by contacting nerve fibers on the cornea that activate the tear glands. Now you are crying. Scientists have tried to make a non-crying onion, but it seems that the crying enzymes are also responsible for the zesty onion flavor. But there may be some hope on the way. The group of Japanese plant biochemists that only recently discovered lacrimatory factor synthase, the crying enzyme, believe that it might be possible to develop a non-lacrimatory onion by suppressing the lacrimatory factor synthase gene while increasing the yield of thiosulfonate. Sounds delicious. In the meantime, there are several solutions to try to avoid the problem of onion-induced tears. Heating onions before chopping, cutting under a steady stream of water, or wearing goggles. The most reliable, ordering takeout. Chapter 2. Body Oddities. I am finally able to escape from the torture of Jeremy's food inquisition, and I look around and can't find Laner anywhere. The bottle of Don Julio is missing, and there is a trail of shrimp tails that leads to the elevator. I find him sitting in the hallway, playing chutes and ladders with the neighbor's children and devouring cocktail sauce with a straw. I try to get him back inside, and he snarls, Are you out of your mind? I'm down 150 bucks. His bark is heard inside, and several revelers come outside to watch the action. A crowd has formed around the game, and Mark is becoming surly with the children as his losses mount. It doesn't help that the children are mocking him by singing The Gambler by Kenny Rogers. The tides turn, and Laner has soon wrestled the weekly allowances and the school lunch money from the kids, who disperse, crestfallen, while muttering to themselves. Triumphantly, Laner rises and shouts, Punk-ass suckers, go crying to your mommy. We're going to bring this party back inside and play some strip candy land. He pockets his winnings, swigs the Don Julio, and we are off. Back inside, Wendy Thurston, a senior editor at Half a Dozen Ponds Press, has fallen victim to Laner's shrewd, merciless gamesmanship. She is down to her bra, thong, and socks. As Laner wins another point, she removes her left sock, revealing the most beautiful alabaster-hued foot and immaculately pedicured webbed toes. Teary-eyed, Laner turns to me, and in a choir boy's piping soprano weeps, I have just found my Cinderella. This romantic outburst leaves the party in stunned silence, and then I'm again besieged by a slew of body-related questions. What is it about sideshow body oddities that awakens our most primal desires and curiosities? Is it bad to crack your knuckles? As I, Billy, was sitting on the beach, relaxing and leafing through an old copy of the Journal of Manipulative and Physiological Therapeutics, I came across the answer to this age-old question. I also wish my father had known this, because maybe he would have yelled at my brothers less. Cracking your knuckles is not as bad as people think. The usual argument is that knuckle popping causes arthritis. This does not happen. Chronic knuckle cracking may cause other types of damage, including stretching of the surrounding ligaments and a decrease in grip strength, but not arthritis. So what causes the pop? The sound is produced in the joint when bubbles burst in the synovial fluid surrounding the joint. Really interesting, huh? Why are yawns contagious? 
Here are several things we can be thankful are not contagious. Drooling, nosebleeds, itching, seizures, farting. That said, there are several theories for what causes yawns and why they are contagious. It was originally thought that people yawn to get more oxygen, but this appears not to be true. The most common theory is behavioral. In an article examining contagious yawns, Dr. Stephen M. Playtech and others state, contagious yawning may be associated with empathic aspects of mental state attribution and are negatively affected by increases in schizotypal personality traits, much like other self-processing related tasks. Hmm, I find myself yawning right now. What they mean is that people are unconsciously imitating others when they yawn. Humans are not the only species that yawn. Yawning is seen in many animals, including cats, fish, and birds, although we don't know what a yawning fish looks like either. Why do men have nipples? Since our editor thought this question made the best title for this book, we racked our brains to come up with a hilarious, witty, and informative answer to this question. Our attempts proved futile. So in order to finish this book so another brilliant title wouldn't go to waste, we went for the boring, straight, scientific response. Sorry. We are mammals and blessed with body hair, three middle ear bones, and the ability to nourish our young with milk that females produce in modified sweat glands called mammary glands. Although females have the mammary glands, we all start out in a similar way in the embryo. During development, the embryo follows a female template until about six weeks when the male sex chromosome kicks in for a male embryo. The embryo then begins to develop all of its male characteristics. Men are thus left with nipples and also some breast tissue. Men can even get breast cancer, and there are some medical conditions that can cause male breasts to enlarge. Abnormal enlargement of the breasts in a male is known as gynecomastia. Gynecomastia can be caused by using anabolic steroids. So, if Barry Bonds ends up coming to the old-timers game with a pair of sagging 44 double D man boobs, then I think we will finally have our answer to the steroid controversy. Can you lose a contact lens in the back of your head? It is common for people to come into an emergency room because they can't find their contact lens. Sometimes it is found folded and tucked beneath the eyelid, but other times it is nowhere to be found. So where is it? Probably on the bathroom floor at home. A little anatomy lesson. There is nowhere else for it to go. Other commonly misplaced items that lead people to the ER? Tampons, condoms, and car keys. What are goosebumps? It's all about the erectoris pylorum. What, you say, are erectoris pylorum? These tiny little hair erector muscles that contract and raise the hair follicles above the skin. These are goosebumps, or goose flesh, or chicken skin. What causes them? They start with a stimulus such as fear, cold, or the sight of yourself in the mirror after a night of vodka-induced debauchery. This causes the sympathetic nervous system to become activated. The sympathetic nervous system is responsible for the body's fight-or-flight response. This sends a message to the skin and activates those little muscles. What are eye boogers? To answer this question, we called one of my smartest friends, an Ivy League-educated ophthalmologist who is a retina surgeon at a prestigious university hospital. He's the kind of guy who sends me Proust as a birthday gift. Doesn't watch TV, listens to NPR, so we go to him for the answer. Nothing. He tells me he will look it up. This just goes to show you that medical school sometimes misses the really simple stuff. 
So who has the answer? Honorary physician and expert on medical oddities, Mark Lehner, wrote about this malady in Maximum Golf magazine. Here, one pseudo-schizophrenic golfer hears two golf announcers having the following discussion in his head. Announcer B. Michael's a bit off-center. I'd say less than a foot from the left edge of the mattress and maybe a good foot and a half from the right rim. He's got his left arm tucked under the pillow. Announcer A. Which looks to me like a 245 thread count cotton twill shell filled with a 95% Canadian feather and 5% down blend. Announcer B. What's that in the corner of his left eye? A small emerald green particle. Can you make that out? Announcer A. That's the mucopolysaccharide secretion from the lacrimal gland that's accumulated and crystallized overnight, Bobby. Announcer B. I gunk. My mama used to call that a sleeper. Announcer A. Well, we've got a lovely aerial view of Michael's sleeper from the MetLife blimp, Snoopy 2, cruising at 35 miles per hour at an altitude of 1,200 feet. Our thanks to Captain William Schmeckling and his crew for that shot. Absolutely splendid. Announcer B. Chris, he's got to get that out of there. What would you do in this situation? Announcer A. There's the very slightest breeze coming through the open window, but not sufficiently gusty to warrant any sort of major tactical adjustment. I'd use an index finger here, position it on the corner of the eye, precisely there at the lacrimal duct, and just ever so gently, ever so deftly, roll the particle out. Announcer B. You can't try to do too much here. Announcer A. Just get it out, actually. That's a job well done. Announcer B. Reminds me of when Ernie Ells got an eyeful of sandpiper guano at the AT&T Pebble Beach National Pro-Am in 95. Played the back nine basically half blind. One of the most courageous exhibitions I've ever witnessed. This eye gunk is nothing serious. While you sleep, a mixture of oil, sweat, and tears collects near the corners of your eyes. As the tears dry up, you get left with a nice little bit of crust. Chapter 3 All You Never Wanted to Know About Sex The party continues and has taken on a much more serene and romantic tone. Laner's on the couch with his Cinderella and is eating cocktail egg rolls off her webbed toes as they share his bottle of tequila. I am finally free from the body questions and at last can enjoy a drink myself. It seems as though the drama of the evening is over until I hear Laner shout, Can anyone get me some duck sauce? Laner is too impatient and his libido is obviously inflamed so he is unable to wait for the hired help to procure the requested Chinese condiment. I cross the crowded room and find Lehner conducting a focus group on homemade and alternative lubricants. As I reach the front of the group, Lehner is now meticulously mixing exact proportions of Tabasco, runny brie, and a dash of his sacred tequila to form what he now calls his spicy sex balm. I try to suggest that the Tabasco may cause contact dermatitis on the more sensitive parts of the body, but Lehner chooses not to heed my medical advice as he leads his new special friend to his ad hoc laboratory. I am left behind to answer a sudden barrage of questions about sex. With anatomically correct dolls, sex in the city, and internet porn, you'd think there'd be nothing left to learn. But there are still some questions people are afraid to ask until they've had that third martini. Is sperm nutritious or fattening? You are what you eat. In this case, it is somewhat true as sperm contains important genetic material. But sperm, despite its important load, is not particularly nutritious or fattening. The average ejaculate, 
about one teaspoon, contains between two and three hundred million sperm. Total calories, about five. These calories are derived from protein, including enzymes and sugars, mainly fructose, secreted into semen by the prostate gland to provide the sperm with the energy to swim. Other good stuff found in semen includes water, vitamin C, citric acid, phosphate, bicarbonates, zinc, and prostaglandins, a veritable breakfast of champions. Can people in wheelchairs still have sex? If an aroused male is unfortunately the victim of a spinal cord injury, the ability to have sexual intercourse depends on the level of injury. In men, there are normally two types of erections, psychogenic erections, which result from sexual thoughts, and reflex erections, which result from direct physical contact. Psychogenic erections develop from the nerves of the spinal cord that exit toward the bottom of the spine at the T10 to L2 levels. Generally, men with an incomplete injury at a low level are more likely to have psychogenic erections than men with high-level incomplete injury. Men with complete injuries are less likely to experience psychogenic erections. Reflex erections arise in the sacral area of the spinal cord. Many men with a spinal cord injury are able to have a reflex erection with physical stimulation if this pathway is not damaged. Are there any specific things that affect the scent of a woman? My wife's friend once told her that eating pineapple made you smell good down there. The friend had heard this from a call girl. It doesn't get more evidence-based than that. There is, however, no scientific research on this sensitive subject. People do believe that you are what you eat, so what you ingest, ladies, can affect the smell and taste of your womanly secretions. Foods that are often mentioned as having the potential to cause problems down there are asparagus, garlic, and curry. Chapter 4. Can I treat it myself? I look at my watch, and I can't believe that it is only 12 a.m. I answer the last of the sex questions and quickly scan the room to make sure that my path is clear to the bathroom. I see an opening and rush off hoping to avoid any more questions. The door is slightly ajar, and I push it open tentatively to find our hostess, Eloise, sitting on the edge of the bathtub. Laner is clutching the massaging shower head and is directing a cold stream of water on her burned and blistered cheeks. As it turns out, Eloise, ever the impeccable hostess, had joined Laner and Cinderella in their laboratory to see if they needed their glasses refilled. Laner then insisted on slathering her with his spicy balm. Little did he know that Eloise had had a deep cleansing facial peel just a few hours before the party, leaving her skin ultra-vulnerable to any corrosive ointments. It was comforting for me to see that in the heedless anarchy of the moment, Laner had actually done the right thing and was correctly caring for her burns. There are two venerable maxims that rule the professional classes. For doctors, it is do no harm. And in the world of jurisprudence, it is anyone who represents himself in a court has a fool for a client. So, if you must be your own physician, do no harm and don't be a fool. Why is it bad to insert cotton swabs in your ears? Oh, the pleasure of the forbidden. Those things that you are not supposed to do are always so enticing. The ears, for the most part, do not require any routine cleaning. Ears are like a self-cleaning oven. With the help of gravity and body heat, earwax will gradually find its way out. If wax appears on the outer ear, a cotton swab may be used. If you can't help but go in farther, you are risking wax impaction or injury. If you do get wax impacted in your ear, you will be in pain and half deaf. There are over-the-counter preparations that can help relieve wax blockage, but warm water in a syringe often works best. As a last resort, you can see an ear doctor or come to the ER for a good cleaning. 
It is not uncommon for us to see patients who have violated these rules and come to see us to remove the tip of the cotton swab that has fallen off inside the ear. Don't worry, we are prepared. We also remove other things like cockroaches, beads, and pen caps, all of which we've pulled out of ears. If you get bitten by a snake, should you suck out the venom? I love a good Western, and nothing could be more badass than biting into a snake wound and spitting out the venom. Of course, this would be followed by some whiskey and a good gunfight. Unfortunately, this is no longer an accepted practice. Sucking at a snake bite is not only ineffective, but could lead to an infection at the wound site. According to the American Red Cross, these steps should be taken after a snake bite. One, wash the bite with soap and water. Two, immobilize the bitten area and keep it lower than the heart. Three, get medical help. Toxicology experts might also suggest applying a tourniquet loosely above the bite to prevent the venom from spreading. This must be done with caution as the tourniquet itself can cause problems if it cuts off the blood flow entirely. The person then needs to be transported rapidly to an emergency room. Antivenin is available for a variety of different snakes. Other treatments include antibiotics and surgery. Of the estimated 120 different types of snakes found in the United States, about 20 are poisonous. Most bites occur in the southwestern part of the nation, but they can even occur in New York City. In New York State, there are three species of poisonous snakes, the timber rattlesnake, the massasauga rattlesnake, and the copperhead. In the city, however, most bites occur from snakes that are kept as pets. Does bathing in tomato juice remove the smell of a skunk? For those of you who were watching TV in 1970, you may have seen episode eight of the first season of The Partridge Family, when a skunk finds its way onto the family bus and turns the partridges into stinkers. Reuben remembers that tomato juice can remove the skunk odor, so the family bathes in it. All is well until the family dog gets them covered again. Without time to take another tomato bath, the band plays their concert at a children's hospital from inside a glass-enclosed operating room. That's great TV. The major molecules that make skunk spray smell are sulfur compounds. It is a common belief that tomato juice removes the smell, but there is no scientific evidence to support this claim. The tomato juice probably just tricks the nose into not recognizing the skunk smell through the overpowering red gravy scent. One recommended treatment for pets is one quart 3% hydrogen peroxide, one cup baking soda, and one teaspoon of mild dishwashing detergent. People can try the same, but be careful. The peroxide can have a bleaching effect. Chapter 5. Drugs and Alcohol Eloise, with her wounds cleaned and dressed, is back in business and is refreshing glasses and making small talk. Lena appears wounded from his laboratory mishap and is quietly sitting cross-legged in the corner, sullenly nursing the dregs of his bottle of tequila. I've never condoned casual drug use, but I almost feel compelled to spike the punch bowl with a strong sedative and sneak out to find my way home. I resist this evil urge and feel better until I am confronted again by the indefatigable but once fat guy, Jeremy Burns. Jeremy, aside from his Atkins obsession, has never grown out of his penchant for fraternity hijinks. Eloise offers him one of her signature frozen daiquiris, but Jeremy only wants a jello shot, a beer bong, or some ecstasy. Eloise turns her nose up at his boorish request, and he turns to me to plead for a prescription for some medical-grade marijuana. I explain to him that prescription pot is not available in New York and that I wouldn't give it to him anyway. 
Jeremy is not ready to give up and asks, Then can you get me any of that shit that Rush Limbaugh takes? Oxycontin, I reply. Yeah, yeah, he says. Oh, and also some of that stuff that Matthew Perry and Brett Farr do. Vicodin, I reply again. Jeremy says that he already has plenty of Vicodin and asks if maybe I can just get him a little ketamine. I am becoming exasperated, and I realize that I have an opening. Jeremy, you know that ketamine is a potent horse tranquilizer, and that guy over there is a veterinarian, I say, pointing to a portly, balding gentleman in the next room. Jeremy rushes off as I breathe a sigh of relief. With a culture dedicated to the use and abuse of caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, and an endless array of illegal substances, questions abound about the safest and quickest ways in which we can intoxicate ourselves and how to avoid the dreaded hangover. Beer before liquor, never sicker. Liquor before beer, never fear? This one isn't all that clear. Or maybe it's because of those drinks we just had. The biggest problem with this rhyme is that nobody seems to remember how it goes. As for the science, there is no research to prove or disprove it. One theory about this little ditty attempts to explain that the carbonation in beer causes increased alcohol absorption. There is no proof that this is true. Nor should you believe that coffee will help you with a hangover or that bread will absorb the alcohol in your system. Only time will cure your pain as you wait for the alcohol to leave your bloodstream. Intoxication is defined as a blood alcohol level of 100 milligrams per deciliter, 0.10%. In adults, the level usually falls about 15 to 20 milligrams per deciliter per hour. Everyone metabolizes differently, but on average, it would take about six to eight hours for you to return to normal from a mild, drunken state. Here are various blood alcohol concentrations and their attendant symptoms. 0.02% lightheaded. 0.05% mild euphoria. 0.08% loss of critical judgment. 0.10% lack of coordination and balance, 0.15% disorientation, 0.20% vomiting, 0.30% drunken stupor, 0.40% coma, 0.45% and above death. Simply put, alcohol causes intoxication, so the more you drink, the sicker you get. It doesn't have anything to do with the order in which you tend to chug your beer or wine. As for the dreaded hangover that follows, it is caused mainly by dehydration and interrupted sleep. The sleep and water that will ultimately cure you are not as interesting as some of these famous hangover cures. 1. The prairie oyster. Olive oil, tablespoon of tomato ketchup, one egg yolk, salt and pepper, Tabasco, Worcestershire sauce, vinegar or lemon juice. 2. Cold pizza. 3. IV fluids. Helps to date an MD or paramedic. 4. The hair of the dog that bit you. In other words, the blessed Bloody Mary. 5. Vitamins B and C. 6. And the most effective and most expensive, kidney dialysis. Can poppy seeds make you test positive for heroin? If it's the Jewish holiday Purim and you plan on competing in the Olympics, you may want to think twice before gorging on poppy seed humantashen. Eating enough poppy seeds can cause your urine to test positive for opiates. It's difficult to say how many poppy seeds you need to eat to fail your drug test, but some reports have stated that three poppy seed bagels, for example, could generate a positive test result. Pastries and cookies that contain heavy amounts of poppy seeds, like humantashen, could also lead to a positive test. There is an additional test that looks for certain chemicals present in heroin that are not present in poppy seeds. So, your athletic future really will depend on the exact test you are taking. 
What is the poppy seed heroin connection? Cultivated poppies are the source of opium from which morphine and heroin are produced. Does marijuana help glaucoma? There are some important medical uses for marijuana, and some of these lead to solid arguments for legalization. However, the use of marijuana for glaucoma does not appear to have any benefit over available medications. Marijuana does reduce pressure in the eye, but in order to sustain this reduction, you would have to smoke about 10 to 12 joints a day. Your eye pressure might be lower, but you will be too stoned to get anything else accomplished except naked guitar playing, gluttonous pork rind consumption, or deriving profound meaning from Rob Schneider films. Can you get high from licking a toad? Poor, sad toads. They always seem to take a backseat to the frogs. Frogs get kissed and turn into princes, and toads just get to cause warts. Well, here's some good news for toads. Toads do not cause warts. Toads do, however, produce a protective substance in the parotid gland behind the eyes. This toxin can make animals such as dogs very sick and can be irritating to the human eye. But some people go way beyond touching toads and actually lick them in an attempt to get high from a psychedelic substance supposedly found on its skin. The species known as the bufo toad does have a psychedelic substance on its skin. This substance is similar to serotonin and LSD and can cause hallucinations. Be careful when trying this method because some people have been arrested for toad licking. Chapter 6. Bathroom Humor. Laner seems to have rebounded from his brief period of remorse and sorrow and is now back to his crazed ways. Tequila in hand, he is delivering a rambling, quasi-coherent lecture about cultural differences in post-defecation hygiene. The audience is appalled, yet raptly entranced by his scholarly, scatological soliloquy. As Lehner continues, a hand pops up in the back of the room. The hand belongs to Joel Blake, a celebrity orthodontist, who starts to ask a question, but begins to stammer as tears well up in his eyes. Laner moves through the crowd with the style and empathic grace of Oprah Winfrey, grabs his hand and says, It's okay, Joel. You can tell us. You are among friends. I wipe standing up, Joel blurts out. There's a cackle from the gallery, but Laner silences the offender with an icy stare. We need to honor everyone's way of wiping. Laner says serenely as he hugs Joel. The bathroom and all that occurs behind closed doors may be the final taboo. Yet when placed in a comforting environment or in a locker room, people will share their secrets, often to unfortunate results. Is it more sanitary to be spit on or peed on? There is no specific course in medical school to deal with all the secretions that you find yourself faced with as a doctor. It is definitely a rude awakening to find yourself being coughed on, spit on, and even urinated on. All doctors have been doused in a variety of bodily fluids. One wonderful evening in the ER, I heard a nurse screaming. I found her desperately trying to keep a drunk patient who had passed out from hitting the floor. He was not a small man, and the dead weight was too much to manage. The only way I could get him back on the stretcher was to grab him from behind and throw myself on the stretcher with the patient on top of me. Simple. I could then just roll him over. I unfortunately didn't plan on him using me as a bedpan the instant we hit the bed. This is disgusting, of course, but when faced with the option of being urinated on or spat on, I would choose urine. No, this is not a fetish. Normal urine is sterile. 
It contains fluids, salts, and waste products, but it is free of bacteria, viruses, and fungi. It is not always fragrant, but is certainly cleaner than spit. Spit contains large amounts of bacteria and thus is filthy. Why do beans give you gas? It is unbelievable how much information there is available about farts. Flatulence is the subject of numerous medical studies, books, and CDs. One company even makes a fart filter and underpants designed to absorb odor. But among all this gaseous information, it always comes back to the bean, the most famous farting food. Beans contain high percentages of sugars, oligosaccharides, that our bodies are unable to digest. When these sugars make it to our intestines, bacteria go to work and start producing large amounts of gas. We also form gas from other sources, including the air we swallow, gas that seeps into our intestines from the bloodstream, and carbon dioxide formed from saliva reacting with stomach acid. There is some help available for those who can't handle their beans. A product called Beano is readily available. Beano contains a food enzyme extracted from mold, 1-alpha-galactosidase, that helps us to break down the complex sugars in gassy foods. Another method is to soak beans before you cook them, as this cuts down on their gas-producing power if you then discard the water. Unfortunately, you also lose some water-soluble vitamins by doing this. Other flatogenic foods are broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cooked cabbage, raw apples, radishes, onions, cucumbers, melons, coffee, peanuts, eggs, oranges, tomatoes, strawberries, milk, and raisins. Notice the abundance of vegetables on the fart-producing list. That is why those vegetarians are always passing wind in yoga classes as they contort themselves into weird positions. Is it dangerous to hold it when you have to pee? My junior high school biology teacher instilled fear in our young hearts when he told us that if we got into a car accident with a full bladder, the bladder could rupture. He was right. In general, a full bladder ruptures more easily than an empty bladder. This doesn't mean that your bladder will explode if you hold in your urine because your dad, husband, or brother won't make a pit stop. Our bodies have a non-voluntary reflex mechanism to prevent our bladder from getting too distended, called the micturition reflex. When our bladder gets distended, there are stretch receptors in the bladder wall that let us know that it's time to go. As we all know, this is not the most comfortable sensation if you wait too long. These sensory neurons cause contractions that can become strong enough to overcome the muscle tone holding the urethra shut and release all that urine. Chapter 7. Medicine from the Movies and TV The flurry of bathroom talk was cathartic, leaving everyone feeling purged and invigorated. Joel, with a newly found confidence, is leading a small group in a game of charades. Laner, with the nearly empty tequila bottle in one hand and a fat cohiba in the other, is gesturing madly and attempting to act out a scene from Gone with the Wind. I mistake Laner's gesticulations for a focal seizure, and I run across the room to administer first aid. The group assumes that this is all part of the clue giving and continues to shout out movie titles. Laner's face is contorted in a bizarre grimace as I assist him to the ground and protect his airway with a head tilt and jaw thrust. Laner is now scowling, and I realize this is not a seizure as Cinderella incorrectly guesses Spartacus. Joel shouts out, Vision Quest! And Jeremy quickly replies, Dude, they're not wrestling. I think they're in love. Joel quickly responds, the birdcage. And Cinderella guesses, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Jeremy turns to me and blurts out, 
Are Oompa Loompa's orange from eating too many carrots, or are those little bastards just using too much self-tanner? Before I can respond, Eloise saunters over and astonishingly says, in a slow, wistful drawl, It's got to be gone with the wind. I'd have a fit, too, if my ten million dollar Charleston bungalow burned to a crisp. Oh, poor, beautiful Tara. People often leave the movie theater filled with questions about what they've seen on the screen. After a thrilling episode of ER, I can always expect to get a call. Is the show ER accurate? Accurate. Adjective. 1. Correct in all details. 2. Free of mistakes or errors. Of course it's not completely accurate. It's TV. But the writing staff does capture the general controlled chaos of an ER. They deal with real medical cases, but their medical depictions are always embellished to add a little extra Hollywood flair. I did my residency in emergency medicine in Los Angeles when ER was just starting and the writers often came by our hospital looking for new ideas. One patient I saw there was portrayed in an early episode and highlights the writer's taste for the dramatic. One day, a baby was playing with a coat hanger and the tip of the hanger got stuck in the back of his throat. The paramedics carefully brought the baby into our ER with the hanger dangling from his mouth. This was, of course, very dramatic looking and we all rushed over immediately. The child was scared but was breathing fine and my fellow doctors and I did our best to just leave him alone and keep him calm. Rule number one of medicine, do no harm. An x-ray showed that the tip of the hanger was superficially caught up on the back of the child's throat. Now, for the big dramatic ending, we simply reached inside and removed it. Case over. On ER, however, when the glamorous doctors tried to remove the hanger from the child's throat, the baby started to bleed profusely. After an emergency tracheotomy, some miraculous bedside surgery, and a little on-screen romance, this child was just barely saved. Is there really a medication that acts like a truth serum? Action heroes like Arnold Schwarzenegger often find themselves faced with an interrogator who uses a truth serum to get the hero to reveal his secrets. In the movies, our heroes are able to resist these potions and hide the truth. Hiding the truth seems also to prepare action heroes for a successful career in politics. They seem pure fiction, but truth serums do exist. Barbiturates such as sodium amytal and sodium pentothal were first used as truth serums in the early 20th century. These drugs inhibit control of the central nervous system and were used by physicians to help patients recover forgotten memories or repressed feelings. They are also used for patients with suspected conversion disorder, a condition in which psychological problems produce physical symptoms. An amatol interview is performed by administering a small amount of this drug intravenously. The drug produces a state of drowsiness, slurred speech, and relaxation. This condition makes patients more susceptible to suggestion, allowing the potential to uncover repressed feelings or memories. Today, these interviews are seldom performed. The truth serum will not necessarily make you tell the truth. Patients may lose inhibition, but will not lose all self-control. Therefore, they are still able to control their behavior and lie. Studies have shown that during these amatol interviews, patients often demonstrate a distorted sense of time, show memory disturbances, and have difficulty distinguishing between reality and fantasy. So the line between fact and fiction becomes even more blurred. Does hysterical blindness really exist? On an episode of King of the Hill, Hank accidentally sees his mother in bed with her new boyfriend and suddenly loses his vision. In the movie Hollywood Ending, Woody Allen's character has the same problem because he is so nervous about the film he has to direct. 
So does this sudden blindness really happen outside of the movies and TV? The answer is definitely yes. And it is not unusual to see these patients in the ER. Hysterical blindness can occur as a result of a psychological stress, a conversion disorder, or someone can intentionally fake blindness for some secondary gain, malingering, a prisoner who says he can't see in order to try to avoid going directly to jail. It is not difficult to figure out when patients say they are blind but can actually see. We have a simple test that lets us determine whether the eyes are functioning. Using a rotating striped drum, we test for something called optokinetic nystagmus. As the drum spins, normal eyes will be seen moving back and forth. If a striped rotating drum is not available, you can always use a picture of JLo's rear. Move it back and forth, and any normal eyes will follow. Chapter 8 Old Wives' Tales It's now 4 a.m., and people are drunk, bloated, and exhausted. Laner is recovering from his Academy Award performance and has his tongue inside the tequila bottle, trying to extract every last drop. He removes his mouth from the bottle and says, The tongue is God's gift to the human race, the ultimate organ of poetry and pleasuring. Laner goes on to say, The lingua, blessed instrument of storytelling that allows me to continue the tradition of the oral urban legend. Jeremy, still stinging from his loss in charades, confronts Laner and says, I am so sick of all your stories. My tongue tells me that you should kiss my ass. Although it's late for most, nothing motivates Laner more than verbal provocation. He responds with glee. Ah, Jeremy, in medieval times, Kissing the ass of a fool's sister was said to cure acne. Have you noticed how clear my skin is lately? Thank your sister for me. Jeremy leaps at Laner, and the two of them tumble around the floor in a grunting adolescent flurry of fists and fury. They roll toward the living room, and Laner, although in a seemingly suffocating headlock, is still able to continue his grand historical survey of old wives' tales. The Visigoths believed that Eating juniper berries would make them strong for battle. Jeremy tries to silence Laner with a jab to the throat, but in a hoarse voice, Laner adds, All it did was cause excessive flatulence. Urban legends and folklore can be the cause of tremendous uncertainty. People often desperately want the record set straight on some of these common myths. So, here you go. Is it true that you have to wait a half hour after eating to go swimming? As a child, no time seemed longer than the time spent waiting to jump back in the water after a meal. This half hour in hell is not based on science, but rather on the minds of nervous parents. There's absolutely no medical evidence that supports waiting 30 minutes before getting back in the pool. Digestion begins immediately when you put food in your mouth. But once the food arrives in your stomach, it takes about four hours to process there completely. Food then passes into the small intestine, where it spends another two hours, and then on to the large intestine for another 14. These times vary widely depending on what you eat, so don't set your watch by it. This doesn't mean that it's safe to eat 12 hamburgers and then try to swim the English Channel. Use your head and listen to signals from your body. If you feel pain, cramping, or severe fatigue when swimming, get out. And please, don't puke in the pool. Do microwaves cause cancer? This morning, I microwaved the milk for my coffee. And a few hours later, I heated up some lasagna for lunch. If what you read on the internet is true, I should have about 12 more hours to live. But no studies have proven modern microwave usage to be harmful. Much of the fear about the cancer-causing agents of microwaves has to do with radiation. Basically, anything that moves is radiation, including visible light, 
ultraviolet rays, X-rays, and microwaves. Ionizing radiation, such as X-rays, have enough localized energy to do chemical damage to the molecules they hit. Non-ionizing radiation, such as microwaves, do not damage molecules. One possible danger with microwaves is that heated products can explode even after they are removed from the microwave. Exploding eggs are specifically dangerous. Many injuries have been reported, and some doctors in the United Kingdom have even pressed for warning labels. Is it dangerous to hold in a sneeze? The old wives' tale warns us that if you hold in a sneeze, your head might explode. That won't happen, but you can do yourself some harm. A sneeze is a very complicated thing that involves many areas of the brain. A sneeze is a reflex triggered by sensory stimulation of the membranes in the nose, resulting in a coordinated and forceful expulsion of air through the mouth and nose. The Guinness Book of World Records reports the longest sneezing bout ever recorded was that of a schoolgirl from the United Kingdom. She started sneezing on January 13, 1981, and didn't stop sneezing for 978 days. The air expelled by sneezes is said to travel up to 100 miles per hour, and an unimpeded sneeze sends two to 5,000 bacteria-filled droplets into the air. Holding in a sneeze potentially can cause fractures in the nasal cartilage, nosebleeds, burst eardrums, hearing loss, vertigo, detached retinas, or temporary swelling called facial emphysema. Therefore, it is best to let your sneeze fly, but please cover your nose and mouth. Chapter 9. Getting Older I can't believe it's not over yet. I feel as though this evening has taken years off my life. Lena and Jeremy have been separated, and there are only a few stragglers left picking at the remnants of Eloise's glorious buffet. Even Lena seems beaten down from a combination of toxic tequila, amorous adventures, and verbal violence. He is leaning on the credenza and says to me as he agonizingly stretches his neck, I used to be able to drink, womanize, and brawl and come out of it all as fresh as a daisy. Now I feel limp and shriveled like a rotting clump of stinkweed. Laner stands and arches his back uncomfortably. Did I mention my prostate feels a little swollen? With that, I turn and exit the party. There are many advantages to getting older. Early bird specials, senior citizen discounts, the fact that people don't ask you to help move a sofa up a flight of stairs, and getting away with saying whatever the hell pops into your head. But there are some perplexing changes ahead for all of us. Why does hair turn gray? All the hairs on our head contain pigment cells that contain melanin. Pigment cells in our hair follicles gradually die as we age. The decrease in melanin causes the hair to become a more transparent color, like gray, silver, or white. Premature gray hair is hereditary, but it has also been associated with smoking and vitamin deficiencies. Early onset of gray hair from birth to puberty, can be associated with medical syndromes, including dyslexia. A more interesting question is why old ladies insist on trying to cover up their gray hair with bright blue hair dye. Do your ears continue to grow after the rest of your body stops growing? Prince Charles may worry about this very question. There are definitely some changes in the face that occur with aging. First, some facial muscle tone is lost, causing that saggy look. Then you get the dreaded double chin. The nose can also lengthen a bit, and the skin on the face becomes thin, dry, and wrinkled. Then there are longer, thicker eyebrows and gray hair. We haven't even mentioned droopy eyes, receding gums, 
missing teeth, and last but not least, bigger ears. Yes, your ears do continue to grow as you age, but only slightly. This is probably due to cartilage growth. What a list of wonderful things to look forward to as we enter our golden years. What's up with the ear hair? You lose the hair where you want it and gain it in all those other unsightly places. Bushy eyebrows, excessive nasal hair, and hairy ears certainly don't make you anxious to get older, do they? Sometimes the excessive growth of hair in the ears is genetic and is linked to the Y chromosome, the sex chromosome found only in males, which explains why you don't see many hairy-eared females, except in the Lord of the Rings movies. And what would this excessive hair growth be without a competition? The Guinness Book of World Records record for the longest ear hair was broken again in 2002. A 70-year-old from Tamil Nadu state in India, Anthony Victor, broke the record with his ear hair measuring 11.5 centimeters. Do your nails or hair grow after you die? Human nails and hair do not grow after death. The fact of the matter is that after you die, your body starts to dry out, creating the illusion that your hair and nails are still growing as the rest of you shrivels up. Can aluminum cause Alzheimer's? If aluminum caused Alzheimer's, wouldn't the Tin Man have needed a brain rather than a heart? Aluminum intake is unavoidable. It comes primarily from food, drinking water, and pharmaceuticals like antacids. It occurs both naturally and as an additive. It also can leach into food from the pans we use. Aluminum has been linked with Alzheimer's disease since the 1960s. For almost every study in favor of a connection, there has been a study against it. Like many scientific theories, there remain many unanswered questions. The majority of scientists now believe that if aluminum plays any role in Alzheimer's at all, it is very small. What does this mean for us? It means we can relax. Aluminum is the third most common element in our world after oxygen and silicon, so it would be extremely difficult to entirely avoid aluminum. If you do choose to try and avoid aluminum, you can drink filtered water, avoid aluminum-containing antiperspirants, and be careful when cooking acidic or basic foods in aluminum-containing cookware. If you are going to be an anti-aluminum crusader, we hope that you will be consistent. There is nothing more annoying than people preaching to you about eating organic while they are smoking cigarettes.